Hey guys, welcome to part two of Saving Our Solar Shed. In this video, we're going to be installing purlins, which you see right down here. We're going to stain these a dark brown first, and then uh, put these up on the rafters you saw us install in the previous episode. And I'll also be putting in the uh, Simpson Hurricane ties on the solar shed side of the rafters. Okay, let's get started. So we laid out the boards and started staining. Yvonne started using a brush but quickly switched over to a rag. Ragging the uh, boards with this stain is just a lot faster and quite frankly a lot more economical too. So we put a coat of stain on either side and then a little bit later I went back and hit the boards with a second coat just to darken them up a little bit. This was certainly a lot easier than trying to stain them after the purlins had been installed. Here I'm installing Simpson rafter ties using inch and a half galvanized roofing nails. And one goes on each side, or I should say one was installed on each rafter. Okay, so I've got these uh, hurricane ties or rafter ties from Simpson installed on the solar shed. And I want to give a shout out to Dizinar. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Dizinar, he reminded me to make sure that I do something with this corner down here. And so what I did was I got these incredibly heavy duty angle braces from Simpson that will fit right in there. So that's going to be my solution for that. Thanks, DZNR. Appreciate it. When installing the purlins, I just took the time to pre-drill and countersink the screws. And it was for no other reason except that I didn't want the boards to be splitting on me. It only took a few extra seconds and uh, made the job a little bit easier. I'm using clamps to hold the boards tight up against the uh, against the beam in the front course. So the purlins are getting screwed in 24 inch on center and I'm putting in two two and three quarter inch screws per uh, rafter and I am taking the time to countersink these. I know it's soft wood and it would drive it right in but I really want to avoid any splitting. So I'm just going to continue getting these done. Okay, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for the wind. It's picking up a little bit, but I wanted to get these purlins installed today. So I've got the first two rows installed, and as you can see, I forgot to stagger these joints. I meant to the whole time I was thinking about it, but I had a uh, lapse of memory, and it happens when you get a little older. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking an 8-footer, and I just marked dead center. I'm going to do this 24 on center, and I took another... One, one of the uh, eight foot purlins and split it in two and those will go on the end. So I have my joints staggered on this. It should add a little bit more structural integrity. Okay, I really wanted to get this done today and I managed to do it. I got the purlins installed, 24 on center and good to go. Okay, it's Saturday morning and I just got back from picking up our metal roofing for the overhang and I got five sheets 80 inches long there's going to be a little bit more than I'm gonna to have to cut from a remainder piece from our original roof so I'll have to cut that with an angle grinder but uh, picked up five pieces 80 inches long a bag 150 screws and this cost uh, $113 including tax it was I believe 275 a linear foot it's 29 gauge with a um, with, with a painted surface or a colored surface. So let's get started on the roof. It's 
So I'm getting the panels up the best I can, and then I'm screwing in whatever I can reach. Once all the panels are up, I'll get up on top and fill in the spots that I can't get from the ladder. In an effort to save a little money and not waste materials, I'm reusing a piece left over from the original solar shed roof. It just has to be cut down to 80 inches long and then about 18 inches wide. I'm using a four and a half inch angle grinder with a metal blade. Goes through it no problem. Here Yvonne's going to give me a hand because I'm ripping it uh, in the length and I just need a little bit of extra support to make sure that it doesn't bend over on me while I'm cutting it. Okay guys, we're calling it quits for today because we're getting surrounded by thunderstorms. They're coming in from the southeast. We see some over in the northeast and southwest. So better safe than sorry. We did get the panels up, a couple little glitches. I'm gonna have to order some trim pieces which I was hoping to, to get away without using. But if you see that L shape right there, that is what's gonna be needed on both sides to cover, to cover that gap it's right there. So that'll complete that. And on the other side, because I wasn't planning for those gable trim pieces, I'm gonna to have to use the angle grinder cut that back just a little bit but it'll get cleaned up when it gets those when it gets the trim pieces on the other thing you know I could say that everything went smoothly but it wasn't hundred percent smooth uh, for some reason this is not hundred percent square some reason it's probably because I didn't make it hundred percent square should have but I didn't so I had a little bit of stair stepping going on with the panels as they were hanging over so Yvonne and I just snapped the chalk line and I use the angle grinder and just cut it so that it's even all the way down. Once the gutter is up and the downspout for the rain collection, you're not gonna see it anyway. Otherwise, it's all buttoned up and I'm gonna get the trim pieces on Monday, so we will continue it then. It's Sunday morning, the roof panels are up. They worked great in the storm last night. I can't get my trim pieces until tomorrow, so I'm going to make some bottle bricks. So I'm using a small little wet saw that I bought uh, about six months ago to make bottle bricks and a six inch, I believe it's a six inch uh, diamond blade on this that is designed for cutting glass. Wearing safety glasses and gloves, this little saw makes quick work of cutting the bottles. Sometimes the bottles do break unevenly, but I'm able to kind of trim it up and smooth it out a little bit, and it'll work just fine for the uh, the purpose of being a bottle brick. So right now I'm just cutting all the wine bottles that we've collected, and the second batch will be the beer bottles. I'm cutting each one to six inches in length so that when I put it together, it'll make about a 12 inch brick. And that should be about the right width for uh, the straw bale walls that we'll be building. So now that the bottles have been cut, I'm just cleaning up the uh, inside because once they're taped together, I won't have another opportunity to do this. And just wiping them down a little bit. And once this is completed, I will get some duct tape and uh, match them up and create the bottle bricks. A couple things that we've learned by making bottle bricks in the past is whenever possible, we try to combine a dark with a light glass or a clear glass, and that will allow more light to come in from the outside. So this would be the outside of the wall, that would be the inside, and the amount of transmitted light is uh, greatly increased. 
The other thing that we've also realized is that if you have any bottles that do not match in size, if one is substantially larger or smaller than the other, it really doesn't matter. As long as you can tape them secure, it's all going to be covered in cob. You won't even see the difference. So that really doesn't play a role. So now that I've got that, I'm just going to get some duct tape and tape this together. As far as what tape I use, I just use whatever I've got available that is good and sticky. doesn't need to be clear. It makes no difference. No light is going to be transmitted from the side of the bottle, which is why I don't remove the labels either. It's just one step that just doesn't need to be done. You won't see them, and it doesn't uh, affect the amount of light that's transmitted. There you go, a 12 inch bottle brick, bottle brick. So after I got done making the bottle bricks, my OCD kicked in and I went back and started looking at the shed again and decided I just couldn't leave it the way it was. There were some uh, small issues that I just needed to fix and I want to take you through those so you know uh, exactly what got done. I didn't film it, but I do want to fill you in on uh, the changes that I made. Okay, so what was driving me crazy was the fact that I had this panel here hanging over the edge probably about an inch, an inch and a half. And as a result, this this edge over here did not come right out flush with the purlins. And it was driving me crazy, and that was the reason that we were going to put that trim piece up, was basically to cover a mistake. So I said to Yvonne, I said, I got to take these down, and I did. And with her help, we took all the panels down, shifted them over, and, uh, and put them up again. And now we have them flush here and flush on the other side. And we are going to forego the trim pieces. We've decided we're just going to leave it as is. The overhang here that we cut using the angle grinder is still good and straight. I did have to make one slight adjustment on the last panel over here. On that last panel that runs right from there to the end, I did have to take another quarter inch or so off to make it work, but now it's straight. I've gone along and I used an angle grinder and I cut off the protruding screws that were coming through the, uh, through the purlins. And then came back and just kind of hit it with hit it with some stain again, so you couldn't quite see it. It wasn't quite as obvious. A couple other things, just while I'm uh, in this confessional, a couple other things that will have to be modified. When I go to put the gutter up, I'm going to be running a two by four, or the equivalent, right here in between the vertical posts. And that will allow me to attach the gutter. The overhang was actually designed for that. There's a two-inch overhang from here to the edge. And so once these additional two-by-fours are stained and put up, it'll be an, it'll be an overall two-inch overhang, which will drop the water right into the gutter. That's not a problem. Here's the issue. If you take a look at it, you can see, follow the edge along, and it bumps up right at the post. Then it runs flat, and it bumps up again right at that post. And it's because it's hanging out further, because there's more support right there than there is back on either side. So when I put these 2x4s up going horizontal, I'm going to loosen the first row of screws, put that up, and then tighten it down again. And that should actually get rid of that wave and allow that front edge to run straight across you can see it right there it's driving me crazy 
but anyways that's that's the way it's going to be so we're going to forego the side trim i'm going to get started on the two by fours and the uh, rainwater system probably tomorrow and that is it so now you know the rest of the story if there's any questions or comments please feel free to leave them in the uh, comment box below and the next video will be in a couple days and it'll be about putting up the gutters thanks again for watching we appreciate it and we'll see you in the next video